Well, they will be. I did. It's, there's a little red light on. Oh, okay. Hardware is not my strong suit. I've had a few times. I thought they'll fold it to Paris a little bit. Yep. Luckily, it's not that big of a room, and I, I am an East Coaster, so I'm pretty loud. <laughs> but not everyone in this room is. Oh, there we go. I, you just is loud like, like me. Okay. I've been here for 20 years, so maybe I count as a Minnesotan now. I'm not. I'm not sure. You guys can let me know. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Schweitzer with the Office of Broadband and Digital Inclusion. We are so happy to have all of you here today to talk uh, with us and to, and to talk with the state of Minnesota's Office of Broadband Development about the State Digital Opportunity Plan. Um, oh, we had a little issue with our layout here, see? That's okay. Um, the OBDI mission is to build and promote safe access to technology so that all residents of Hennepin County are empowered to thrive in the digital world. We just did a slide merge, and I think we may have some, some modest layout challenges, but that'll be okay. Um, what I wanted to do is just give you all a little bit of background about the work that Hennepin County has done to build digital equity and some of what um, we hope to see in the future. So we all know, those of us in this room know that digital equity is not a new problem, the digital divide is not new, but that COVID really um, raised people's awareness about the gaps that already existed. So um, at Hennepin County, we have long, we're in a library today we have long had library computer labs and training. We also have a long-standing community connectivity program to um, ensure that there is fiber infrastructure throughout the county. During the pandemic, like others, there was a rapid pivot to online services and digital services, and we leveraged CARES funding to meet urgent needs. We distributed thousands of computers, libraries boosted their internet, um, we had Chromebooks being distributed, we had hotspots being distributed, all with county staff and partners. And we all know that all of you in this room were doing similar kind of work and potentially were partnering with us in that. And the conversations we had internally were that what we are doing to leverage this um, pandemic response dollars, that we need this to be sustainable. So we need to establish something that is more permanent to address the longstanding digital disparities in Hennepin County. So we established the Office of Broadband and Digital Inclusion operationalized some of our services and we began doing our ongoing digital equity planning work to really think about what do we need to do to address the gaps in our communities. So right now we are finalizing our own digital equity plan and we're working on just scaling services to continue to meet needs that we know we really are just scratching the surfaces, surface excuse me, of, of the needs out in our community. At Hennepin County we have two primary goals to connect all of our residents to affordable, robust broadband, and to support our residents who have digital barriers with digital navigation, provision of devices, and support for broadband adoption. And we've been doing this in a few main areas. We're working on eliminating unserved areas of Hennepin County to ensure all of our residents have access to high-speed internet. We are really leveraging the Border to Border program through the state of Minnesota, and often matching funds there to do that. We're also looking at the connectivity gaps in multifamily affordable housing and single room occupancy housing and residential facilities. We know that that doesn't always show up in the broadband maps, but that those of our residents who are living in apartments frequently do not have the connect their connectivity needs met. And we're also looking at leveraging programs like the Affordable Connectivity Program to help residents bring down their home internet costs and get a subsidy if they're, if they're eligible. We're also trying to maximize the available county resources and existing touch points. What that means is we want to make sure any county staff member who is working directly with a county client knows that we are available to help meet those, that client's needs. All of our departments continue to offer a lot of their services digitally, and so we want to make sure that the county clients who may not have access to their own computer or their own home broadband, they know how we can help them get that access to um, take advantage of those and we're also engaging community organizations as trusted messengers and digital navigation partners that the county, we're already connected to some residents, other residents, we are not their best connection point to learn about a resource or to have a conversation around their digital needs um, in their own language or in a way that feels culturally appropriate. So we're really trying to leverage um, trusted messengers and best practices to meet those needs in community. And we're also working to ensure that all residents are aware of online safety best practices. That's something that comes up again and again in community as a need. Uh, as a need. 
Since 2020, leveraging federal dollars through the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan Act, we have identified uh, 225.7 miles of fiber that we anticipate will serve almost 2,500 households, local businesses, and community anchors. We're also piloting Wi-Fi projects in our urban and suburban neighborhoods. That uh, involves projects in the city of Minneapolis, in uh, Golden Valley, in St. Louis Park, I believe. We've been opening uh, that opportunity up to any number of urban and suburban cities to identify what projects their, their communities are interested in and providing pandemic dollars for that. We're also looking at apartment projects and single room occupancy projects. We've launched a few already and are really hoping that that is a good model to address some of the connectivity gaps in our cities and suburbs. And we've also done a lot of ECP enrollment support and promotion. There'll be an additional outreach campaign launching soon. And we see that uh, nearly 53,000 residents are currently enrolled in Hennepin County in the Affordable Connectivity Program. We've also been advocating for the importance of sustaining that program and improving it since we know there are some gaps that make um, enrollment more challenging for certain individuals. We also have a digital navigation program. We've distributed nearly 11,000 devices to county residents and nearly, approximately, excuse me, approximately 4,000 re residents have been supported through our staff and our community partners. That's getting one-on-one -on -one support, broadband adoption assistance, training, things like that. We also have an online public safety awareness that is launching next month really to raise uh, the profile of how to be safe online and help people think about um, what actions they can take to be more, um, more careful online. We've also been engaging in a parallel planning process. Today you're really here to learn about what the state is thinking about for the future of digital equity and we're trying to um, build on that and really complement those efforts. So instead of coming to the same community a second time, we're really trying to convene you once and make sure that feedback goes to the state and to us. We recognize that they have a statewide um, charge and that we have a more localized charge. So we're trying to really be mindful and uplift community perspectives. So for the state process, we are here providing feedback on a draft of their plan, but we are still really in a listening mode in Hennepin County that we feel like we wanna make sure we fully heard um, about the community perspectives and that we are right-sizing our programs and filling in the gaps. And we also don't have a federal timeline that we have to be responsible to, uh, which the state does. So I wanna acknowledge that we can take, we can continue this listening mode for as long as we think is appropriate for when we have enough information and they really do have uh, federal timelines to respond to. So there are some differences and some similarities. Um, the parameters for the state digital opportunity plan are set by legislation and NTIA, and Hannah will get into that in great detail later, whereas we can set our own scope. Um, in both instances, community is providing feedback. The state has this digital connection committee model and listening sessions. We are also gathering community feedback. We tried to leverage everything that went through our digital connection committees, any of the um, organizations we were funding, any digital connection committee work that they did. We also had a survey and we tabled all summer long at uh, various community events. We also had uh, a number of individual conversations really focusing on the experience of Hennepin County people who live in apartments. Just we kept hearing about the specific and unique barriers that um, residents of apartments were experiencing, which is really low income and affordable apartments. So a lot of our summer listening focused on that community and how we can best meet those needs. Um, and we're also having uh, additional conversations where we feel that we maybe didn't get enough feedback to feel that we have enough information. So there are a few places we are continuing to listen. Um, OBD, OBD is draft, has drafted their plan. We are giving them feedback now and then NTIA will finalize that plan. Um, our office will draft our own plan. Again, the scope will be slightly different and that plan will ultimately be approved by the county board. We anticipate bringing our version of the plan much as the state is right now out back to community to get a sense of does it meet your needs? What are the gaps? What did we miss before we finalize anything? Again, similar planning inputs. It's really based on data, best practices, community feedback, and at least for Hennepin County, the insights of staff working directly with Hennepin County clients. So those are people who are doing direct service work, either through partner organizations, as a librarian, as a human services staff, as a staff at North Point. We think as, as a county, we have that unique perspective. So we're trying to really 
listen both to people who are personally experiencing digital barriers and the staff who are working directly with those individuals, either as a community partner or as a head of the audience. And that's really all that I had to say. I hope that was under 10 minutes mm -hmm. or close. And I'm going to hand it over to Hannah. I'm not. I'm going to hand it over to Bree <laughs> for a very short period of time. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I just want to uh, thank all the work that has been done um, by your team um, and hosting this event. It's really important for for all of us to have those trusted partners in the community. And clearly, clearly, we have that here in Hennepin County. So. Um, I'm the executive director here at the Office of Broadband, and I'm just going to do a quick hello and really turn it over to Hannah, who is our digital equity lead, who has just, I think, what number? A hundred of these, it feels like, but no. Are, is, are we on 13 today? 15. 15 today. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to lose the track yeah. of these across the state. Um, but um, we also, just other members of our team, um, we have Megan here as well today, who is our Digital Equity Grants Administrator. Um, I hope um, we'll all get to know her really well when our capacity grants uh, come available to us. Um, but for those of you who don't know, we have had uh, the Office of Broadband since 2013 doing infrastructure grants was sort of the foundation of what we were built uh, on. And we're just really excited to be starting to really dive into digital opportunities as well in our office. So this has been a really great experience, uh, a lot of education happening, um, and we'll continue to do that along through the planning process. So with that, I'm here to be a resource and help with any tough questions or questions in general. I'll be here afterwards as well. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Hannah and she's gonna share the wealth of knowledge and information that came from all of you, probably in the connection committees and all the work that has been done across the state already, so. Thanks. Yes. I'm really grateful that there's a microphone today. Yesterday, I had to basically scream for two hours in a high school cafeteria. Oh. Um, <laughs> luckily it was a small high school and there were no students, but it was still a challenge. Um, my name is Hannah Buckland. I'm the Digital Equity Program Lead with the Office of Broadband. I've been there for a little over a year. Prior to that, I worked in libraries for over 10 years, really since I was um, 14, which was way more than 10 years ago now. Um, I worked for Hennepin County Library for 361 days before, <laughs> <laughs> before defecting to the state. Um, so it's great to be back for a, you know, a short term. Um, our agenda for today is we'll cover some background information about the Office of Broadband, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and some other acronyms. Then we'll review the current state of digital opportunity in Minnesota and start digging into this plan that you have before you. The first 12 to 13 slides of this is really dense and filled with a ton of information. This is the part of the listening session where you have to do a lot of listening. Um, but please like, raise a hand or just yell over me if you have a question about something that I've not covered well. So the funding that we're working with in our office now comes from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, parentheses IIJA. This was passed by Congress in November of 2021 and it appropriated $65 billion nationally for broadband infrastructure and digital inclusion activities. There are four different programs within IIJA. Those are listed here. The first one, the Tribal Connectivity Program, specifically supports tribes. In Minnesota, five out of the 11 tribes currently have this grant, and there's another grant application for that one due on January 24th. The second category is the Enabling Middle Mile Infrastructure Program. This supports internet service providers in building out their networks. Third is the Digital Equity Act, which is what we're here to talk about today. And then we have the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, or BEAD. BEAD is the really big one. It's $42.45 billion total. Minnesota is receiving about $652 million of that. And that was determined with a formula that takes into consideration things like um, the the number of unserved locations in the state, the number of underserved locations in the state, the state's geography, 
the focus of BEAD is infrastructure, so fiber in the ground, um, connecting homes and businesses to internet service. With BEAD, we have a separate planning process with a separate draft that's due on a separate day. Um, it's due a little later than the um, digital equity plan is due. So today we're gonna to be focused on Digital Equity Act, but know at the same time our office is also thinking about infrastructure and how to connect all households and businesses to internet service. With the Digital Equity Act, these are the basics of it. Um, it provides $2.75 billion total for digital equity work nationally. This funding breaks down into three different categories. The first category is $60 million for planning grants. Every state and territory is working with this now, and I think tribes are expected to receive planning grants a little later on, or that's in progress. Minnesota's planning grant was $881,905.10. This funding haunts me, and also it supports um, some of our wages, it supports the work that we're doing here today, it supported our digital connection committees, which I'll talk about later. So this funding is purely to do this planning process. Once we've gotten through the plan and the plan has gone to NTIA and been approved, then we have access to a capacity grant. Capacity grants are funded at $1.44 billion total. Um, and so we have yet to find out what Minnesota's portion of that will be. If you do some cross multiplication, it looks like it could be 20 to 25 million, but we are um, playing the waiting game still with that one. Um, so the timeline here, 2023, which apparently is this year, uh, we're working on this digital opportunity or digital equity plan. We have a draft available now. That plan is due in its final form on November 30th, which is getting closer every minute. Um, and time is also speeding up, I think. From 2024 to 2028, that's when we'll have access to that capacity grant to implement the activities that we've identified in the plan. So it's great that you're all here now. Um, while this plan is still printed on the cheapest paper available and in its draft form, we genuinely want this to be Minnesota's plan. This is not the Office of Broadband's plan for Minnesota. Um, and those, those are Bree's words, so I should cite my source. <laughs> the last category of funding within the Digital Equity Act is for competitive grants. So planning grants and capacity grants go to states, tribes, and territories. Competitive grants are administered directly by the federal government to applicants like anchor institutions, local governments, that kind of thing. So the timeline for the competitive grants is parallel to the timeline for the capacity grants. So we could have situations in, in Minnesota and in any state where the state has a capacity grant that they're using to implement activities and maybe a, a county government has a competitive grant that they're using to supplement whatever they are doing through those state funds. So there are a lot of puzzle pieces now and into the future. The definition of digital equity that's included in the notice of funding opportunity for this program is the condition in which all individuals and communities have access to and use of Oh, I'm saying the wrong definition. I <laughs> have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in our society, democracy, and the economy. This refers to options and opportunities. We're not saying everyone has to use technology or everyone has to use technology in the same way. Um, not everyone needs to have technology at home if that's not what they want and how they feel it's best for them. So we're really focused on making sure everyone has the option, though, to bring technology into their life and the opportunity to access what technology enables. This is the definition I started saying previously. Um, so digital inclusion is referring to activities, while digital equity is referring to kind of the state of being. And digital inclusion are the activities that get us to that point. These are the activities that ensure all individuals and communities have access to and use of technology. The first one listed here is affordable internet service. This is one that leans more toward the bead side of things, the infrastructure funding. We can address affordability with the Digital Equity Act, but we'll be looking at infrastructure as well as affordability with bead. The second one here are internet-enabled devices that meet the needs of the user. 
my example for this one is the fact that I still have a flip phone. I have a text. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, it's not a great device by any means. It has a hinge, like a literal hinge. <laughs> 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 Let it say its piece. Like it still makes the nice flipping noise, though. It's a very satisfying tool, um, and it's not internet enabled really, um, but it meets the needs of the user, the very specific needs that I derive from it. That being texting, phone calls, and the alarm clock. Um, separately, I have a computer that has everything else that I I actually need. Um, there's a point of privilege in being able to choose a flip phone and then also separately choose a computer to be able to disconnect in that way. If my budget were more limited, I would maybe just choose to have a smartphone and only a smartphone, <laughs> but I'm not quite there yet. The third activity here is access to digital literacy training or digital skills training. So when you don't know how to do something using technology, who do you ask for help? My example for this one uh, is my parents. And I realized yesterday during session number 14, that I, my parents are not aware that I'm telling everyone this story. <laughs> so my, my dear parents, they, they have two daughters. There's me, the librarian, who's always wearing a cardigan if I'm out in public. And then there's my sister, who's younger and just like the epitome of a younger child. She's way cooler, um, so much cooler. And so she has an iPhone, of course, and I have my flip phone. My parents, wanting to be adopters of technology, have a landline with a cord, and they also have um, iPhones. And when something comes up with their iPhones, they think in their, their minds, like, which daughter do we go to? Do we go to the daughter who's a librarian, or do we go to the daughter who's really cool? And so, of course, they come to me with their technology <laughs> questions about their iPhones, and I have no idea. Like, if you hand me a smartphone, I will very carefully set it down on, like, the nearest stable surface, and then just kind of back away, because I don't want to break it. Um, with the work we've been doing in our office, we've heard again and again and again that friends and family are the most trusted providers of digital skills training, that even if those friends and family don't have the skills themselves, they're still the most trusted. Um, so I refer my parents to my sister, and they're lucky to have her. The fourth category here is quality technical support. It's different from digital skills training. It's quality technical support is referring to when something breaks, who's gonna help fix it. When something starts getting really slow, how do you know whether that's an issue with the actual device or if you just haven't turned your computer off for six months <laughs> and turning it off and turning it back on will solve the issue. Quality technical support can be sometimes harder to come by than digital skills training. The fifth component here refers to applications and online content that enable and encourage self-sufficiency, participation, and collaboration. This is a long way of saying something like software or a subscription to the resources you need. A Microsoft Word license could fall into this category. Every state is doing a digital equity planning process at the same time, more or less. And with these different processes, we're all following um, the same notice of funding opportunity and the same rules, essentially, we're all required to address these eight covered populations that we know are groups of people who are um, disproportionately left behind when it comes to technology, and not just technology. These groups are low-income households, which in the notice of funding opportunity is defined as a household at or below 150% of the federal poverty level. We understand that you can be at 151% and not be you know, the most financially solvent house or financially stable, and that costs related to childcare, transportation, and housing can make a household feel like they're below 150%, even if the numbers say otherwise. So we're looking into the nuances there. The second category is aging individuals, 60 years of age or older. Then incarcerated individuals, veterans, individuals with disabilities, individuals with language barriers, and this could be someone with limited English fluency or someone who's learning to read English, individuals who are members of a minoritized racial or ethnic group, and rural individuals. The majority of Minnesota's geography ends up being considered rural under this definition. There are a couple 
places in the Southern County Metro that end up being rural when you take all the, there's an, like a second definition that narrows it a little further. Um, and so weirdly, North St. Paul is rural according to this. So we have some puzzling to do there still. So. Every state is taking a different approach to this work. There are some states that hired a single consultant and that consultant is taking the money and writing the plan for them. There are states that have one advisory group and that advisory group has a person who represents every faction of life in their state. There are states where they, I don't know if they're human because they're doing listening session tours that have 75 to 80 stops. Um, Megan and I are struggling to <laughs> articulate anything anymore after 14. I checked into the wrong hotel yesterday. Like, that's where we are. <laughs> I was close though, it was the one next door. Um, so in Minnesota, we wanted to really highlight equity in the digital equity planning process. And for us, that means like suspending all of our assumptions and turning to local first, and also making sure that we're taking that planning grant funding and investing it in local places and local work. So the strategy that we've devised are these things that we've dubbed digital connection committees. Digital connection committees are self-selected voluntary work groups. They're formed by all kinds of organizations, cities, counties, tribes, townships, um, libraries, schools, higher education, healthcare, businesses, nonprofits, all of the above. There are committees that bring together all of these. There are committees that bring together some of these. There are committees representing places I've never heard of. It's such a wonderful coming together of perspectives across the state. When I pitched this idea to Bree, she very cautiously was like, okay, but how many do you think you'll have? And I said, maybe 20, I'll try. And we ended up with about 100 of them. <laughs> um, there are almost as many in greater Minnesota as there are in the metro. We have a, a really good geographic spread. The southwest corner is a little bit sparse in Minnesota, but largely the state is covered and these committees have been phenomenal in their work. I know we have some people here today who've been part of committees, so thank you. The scope of work for these committees has been to receive and share updates from our office about this planning process. They've helped gather local information about digital inclusion assets, strengths, and needs. This information has profoundly shaped the plan that we've drafted for today. Um, this is a plan, or a draft of a plan, that I refused to start writing until all of the data from the committees was in, which posed a challenge with the timeline, but it ultimately let us really embed this plan and what we were hearing locally. And last, committees can serve as a network of partners for our office to call on into the future as this work continues. This is a five-year timeline we're looking at in total. Um, and these committees are not the only group that we'll be working with, but they're a group that we will certainly continue working with. This is where we've been this year so far. Um, in January, our office kicked off this feed and digital equity work in February, we started doing some office hours for prospective committees while we were encouraging people to register. In March, there was a grant application due. That grant application was the secret to getting 100 committees. We did non-competitive mini-grants. The maximum funding amount was $4,000, so not a lot of money at all. But the application was simple, and as long as that application was on time and complete and in scope, the organization could receive that funding. That funding enabled organizations to support the staff time and energy and effort it takes to get information about digital inclusion. It supported um, in-state travel at the federal, federally reimbursable mileage rate. Um, it supported internships for some organizations. It provided just like the basics of what it takes to gather information, like the space that you need sometimes. In April, the work, the data collection work itself really began in earnest. Our committees were broadly charged with collecting quantitative and qualitative data, and much to many of their dismay, I was not more specific than that, really. Um, what we wanted was data that was authentic, not data that was like seemingly perfect. 
Um, I think so often in these sorts of statewide planning things, we, we want a perfect set of data that fits really nicely in a spreadsheet and it passes these certain tests and maybe there can be some like comma delineation if we're getting fancy, but we really just want something clean. Um, and for this, I genuinely wanted mess. Um, I wanted to know not just the numbers, but the stories and in encouraging committees to submit data that was authentic, we ended up getting just such a real and creative and exciting wealth of information. That data collection work went through the end of June. June 30th was the data submission deadline. So I woke up on July 1st and I was like, wow, this is, this is the new world for me. I can like relax a little bit and you know, I'll get to just be quiet and do some writing for a while. And then I checked the data submission form and we had 256 different files from all of these committees, which is great. Overwhelming and very authentic, all of it. There were 100 page PDFs of scanned handwritten surveys and there were committees that put together reports and there were committees that created podcasts. There's a committee in um, a really small town in the Arrowhead that set up some kind of recorder and did a transcript of a listening session and submitted the written transcript, part of which includes a side conversation about whether or not two people want to take the fruit that's being offered. It's just like this, <laughs> this intensely northern conversation about like, I don't know, I mean, I guess I could have a banana. <laughs> There's still a few left. Um, just, it's, it's so real and so everything that we wanted and so overwhelming. Um, which is how it should be in a lot of ways. Like digital equity is not a clean, simple solution. It's a mess and we've got to sift through this mess in order to figure out how to move forward. So the month of July was spent writing a lot. That went into August. In August on the 21st, our draft plan was posted publicly. We met our deadline. And on the 29th, these listening sessions began. From here, we're wrapping up the listening sessions next week on Wednesday, I think, if that's the 27th. The 29th is the final day for public comment on the draft plan. In October, we'll do some revisions, a lot of revisions. Um, we inadvertently scheduled more time for revisions, though, than for actually writing this plan. And on one hand, as I realized that in July, I was kind of devastated. <laughs> like, writing this took so long and we could have had an extra week or two if I just like looked at a calendar. Um, but because we have so much time for revisions, we can really make this plan Minnesota's plan. And I'm really grateful for that. November 30th is the date that the final plan is due to the federal government. And then December, I disappear and go somewhere probably warm with water um, that has no internet access where no one can find me. I'll come back eventually, and then in 2024, we'll have access to that capacity grant to implement the activities in the plan. So this is where we are now. We have a full draft of the plan posted online. It also might be sitting in front of you. We have a lot of copies, so please take one. The public comment period is open through December, September 29th. Comments can be submitted using an online form. They can be submitted by, by mail. I'm hoping someone sends a postcard. Um, and anything you share today or just with our staff in general is something that we consider a public comment and that we include. Megan is my note taker and she's doing a great job. <laughs> but like a comment that is spoken to us is just as worthy as a comment that is submitted using the official ish form. And we are on the road. So 16 listening sessions in person total, two virtual ones. Many of these have been valiantly co-hosted by Digital Connection Committees. Um, next week we're in International Falls, Bemidji, and on Zoom. So if you want to go check out the Northern Leaf changes, um, you can come find us there. Are there any questions so far about this process or the Digital Equity Act in general before we move on? Uh, one question. Do you yeah. have a new version? Yes. So the question is, do we have an e-version of the plan? And if you go to the QR code that's listed on this side of the digital draft digital opportunity plan handout, that will take you to our digital opportunity webpage. 
there you'll find a couple different handouts, a full copy that's digital, um, and the comment form as well. And I think there's maybe a more direct link somewhere in this giant document, and I'll share one at the end as well. I'm going to take a sip of water while we can give any additional questions. So we're shifting now to look at the state of digital opportunity in Minnesota. Um, when we're talking about digital equity or digital opportunity and digital inclusion, I tend to go back and forth between these terms. Digital equity is what's in the bill text. It's the Digital Equity Act. My job is the Digital Equity Program Lead. Megan is the Digital Equity Grants Administrator. But we've created this draft digital opportunity plan and this slide says digital opportunity. And the reason for that is that like, when we started this process, we were very focused on this being named a digital equity plan. And as we heard from committees, digital equity was a phrase that wasn't necessarily translating well, in some cases, from English to other languages. It also wasn't a phrase that was very accessible in general. It was a phrase that comes across as jargon and as being like specific to government or specific to like academia. Um, and that's not what we want to do here. We don't want to alienate people just because we decided that we have to use digital equity. Um, digital opportunity tends to have a little bit more immediate meaning to it. It translates better. So this is now a digital opportunity plan. Um, these are some maps provided by our office. We have a ton of them if you ever want to see every possibility of broadband service in Minnesota. Um, and these show areas in the state that are served or unserved or underserved by internet access. The map that's closest to me shows the availability of wireline service at or above the FCC's minimum speed standard of 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. If I lived alone, that would be great for me. I pretty much just do crossword puzzles and watch YouTube videos. I'm really boring. Um, I work from home, but I haven't found that our work from home stuff, at least in my case, is so strenuous that I need really super high speed internet. With the map on the farther side, that one's looking at townships and the availability of wireline service at or above 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. This is a state speed goal. And if I had a, you know, a family I was living with, I, I lived with just one other person, um, 120 would probably be enough most of the time for a family with multiple people doing multiple things at once. These maps tell one story about broadband access and technology access in Minnesota. They show us where, at a really high level, the infrastructure is available, but they don't show us who is accessing that infrastructure, who can afford that infrastructure, and what the future looks like, particularly in these really underserved and unserved areas. If you live here, in the middle of this unserved area, you might still be served. It just is so tiny on this map, you can't see it. You might also not be served, but you can get internet access through a satellite subscription. Um, that's generally not as reliable as wireline to your home or business, but it's still there. Yes, question. Um, can you just, for like a point of reference, like some of the, uh, the towns or cities, just for, for those of us in the back of that eyesight, would you? <laughs> is, is it like around Worthington? Yes. Yeah. Or? Yeah, I think this little clump is Worthington, this okay. little blue dot, and then surrounding Worthington is an unserved area. Right, cool. Yeah, this is Rock County in the southwest corner of the state. They are completely served, pretty much, because they were able to like really strategically use one of the border-to-border -border grants from our office and work with every layer of government that exists within the county's borders. Yeah. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. So when we're talking about digital inclusion, we can you know, look at those maps as one reference point. We can also look at some census data to sort of frame some of this up a little more. This is census data from the 2017 to 2021 five-year estimates of the American Community Survey. Um, 
The column that says broadband subscription is focused on whether or not a household has a subscription to broadband service. The household might not have a subscription because they're located in an area where it's just not an option, it's not available, or they might not have a subscription because they can't afford it. We don't know within this data, we just know yes, they have one, or no, they don't. With mobile data only, this is looking at households that don't have a broadband subscription, they don't have a satellite subscription, what they're relying on is mobile data, so a cell phone data plan or a hotspot in general. We would want those broadband subscription numbers to be a little bit higher and the mobile data only numbers to be a little lower. Broadband service is generally more reliable. Um, you're not gonna run into the data caps that you run into with a mobile data plan. If you have five people using your home internet and it's broadband service, it's probably gonna be able to withstand that. If you have five people all using a single hotspot, that's probably gonna slow way, way down. There are still applications for mobile data in daily life, um, or even just the mobile data only way of being. A person who doesn't have stable housing, who's moving frequently, even a college student who's starting the semester in one place and ending it in another, might find that mobile data is the best choice for them. So across Minnesota, 83.7% of households have a broadband subscription, and 10.9% are relying on mobile data only. Once we start looking through those different covered populations, those disparities between start to become more apparent. These numbers themselves are far from perfect, I'm sure. You know, they're numbers. There are a million ways, maybe even more, that they can be wrong. But the space between the numbers is what I think is most interesting and most telling, like those gaps between different groups of people. Um, and you know, a person doesn't just represent one category or one way of living. Um, these identities are intersectional. A person could fit into all of these categories at the same time. A person could be experiencing poverty for a portion of their life and then not be experiencing poverty anymore, but still feel the effects of that in some way. So this is a nice clean table, but we know it's a lot messier than this. People living in greater Minnesota have a lower broadband subscription rate. This is partly because that service just isn't available. Um, affordability, though, is also cited often as an issue statewide. Um, people from minoritized racial and ethnic groups are disproportionately relying on mobile data only. This, again, is usually an issue of affordability. Poverty tends to be the underlying factor with everything here. So. In Minnesota, people under that 150% federal poverty line, 75% um, have a broadband subscription at home, and almost 20% are relying on mobile data only. Um, people experiencing language barriers is also a, like one of the most disproportionately affected groups of people. 65.3% um, of people who report speaking English not well or not at all um, also report not having, or report having a broadband subscription, and 21% are using mobile data only. With the line here for people who were incarcerated, this is um, separate from the rest of these data points in that this 64.1% comes from a survey that was done by Repowered, which is a tech refurbisher in St. Paul, they hire um, people who are re-entering from having been in prison to develop their technology skills, learn the ins and outs of tech refurbishment. These clients go through a training program, they get job experience, they get a paycheck. So these are people who are very interested in pursuing a career in technology, um, but 64.1% have a broadband subscription. There's also the issue of device access. In this table, we look at laptop or desktops and smartphones. So the column that says laptop or desktop computer, this refers to whether a household has one or more laptops or desktops. It could be a house of eight people that has one laptop and everyone's sharing it. It could be a house of two people that has six laptops and four of them are in the basement covered in dust and will never turn on again. Um, it's a yes or a no again with this one. So it doesn't get into the complexities that we know are out there, but 
but it still provides us with some kind of snapshot of what access to a laptop or desktop can look like. The smartphone only category looks at households that have only a smartphone or smartphones. So the household could have, you know, five people living there, seven smartphones among them, um, but no laptop, no desktop, and no tablet. They would be considered a smartphone only. They, they could also be a house where there's just one smartphone and people are sharing it. That would still be smartphone only. So within each of these, there's still like a gradient of what it means to have access. Across Minnesota, 82.1% of households report having a laptop or desktop, and 7% report having a smartphone only. And again, this is data that comes from a five-year estimate covering 2017 to 2021. Things changed a lot in 2020. Um, so some of that is reflected in here, but not all of it. We need more time. Um, in uh, greater Minnesota, the laptop or desktop number drops, the smartphone number goes up. That happens too across these different groups. Uh, people from minoritized racial and ethnic groups and people living under 150% poverty or disproportionately left behind and people experiencing language barriers again is a group where almost 30% are relying on a smartphone only. You think of, you know, a smartphone is a great lifeline from what I hear. Um, it, can, it can do a lot of things, a lot of really good essential things, especially if it's your only device. If you're trying to take in information, a smartphone is great. If you're trying to put information back out into the world, a smartphone is a bit of a hindrance. It's a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to write a college term paper on your smartphone than it is on a laptop, or to apply for a job on a smartphone, um, to do your taxes on a smartphone. So while it's ultimately an individual choice and a smartphone is important and can be an essential lifeline, sometimes having access to a laptop as well is what a person really needs. As we've gone around the state, we've put together some regional snapshots that summarize what digital access looks like here. Um, it's really a lot easier to do this in the metro because there's more people, which means we can zoom in closer. Um, when we're trying to do this in greater Minnesota, we have to group like four counties together to get enough of a population to be measurable under this public use microdata areas. So statewide, 83.7% of households have a broadband subscription. That goes down to a little under 75% when you're in the city of Minneapolis. If you're in Hennepin County, but outside of the city of Minneapolis, that goes right back up to 85.2%. That, that pattern of Minneapolis having less access than Hennepin County minus Minneapolis repeats itself through this. Um, one of the areas that we've been looking at as we've gone around the state too are the age ranges. You know, as someone who's 60 years old is probably still working. Someone who's 75 and older is probably not working. And that disparity between 60 to 74 and 75 plus is really noteworthy. Um, yesterday in, in Deer River, we showed a, a like a four county version of this, and it was under 40% of adults 75 and over had a broadband subscription at home. Um, in Hennepin County, it's almost 50%. Not great, but better. Something that's interesting to note too is like if you add these two numbers together, you can kind of see that like, that, you know, it's around 90% of, of adults 70 or 60 to 74 in Hennepin County having access to either broadband or a data plan. Um, and if you add these two up, you see that it's about 55%, so it's, it's a lot lower, just having access to broadband or a data plan. We also looked at access to broadband subscriptions, data plans, laptops, and smartphones among Hennepin County's BIPOC residents. Um, and these follow the same pattern that we've seen on the other slides too, of just those rates dropping right away. So 20% of um, BIPOC residents in Hennepin County are relying on a smartphone. 16.5% are relying on mobile data only. Are there any questions about these numbers before I move on? I think just a comment 
argument that Minneapolis is obviously a large area, but there's significant discrepancies between neighborhoods in Minneapolis that are just uh, follow those same trends. Yeah. Yeah, like for any do you have any data point, there is a spectrum within yeah. that. Um, you see that with the ages, you can, you know, if you look at Minneapolis, I think there are three or four public use microdata areas in Minneapolis, and you can zoom in further on like a, a multi-neighborhood level. Um, if you look at data around people with disabilities and access to the internet, a person who has one disability is probably right around whatever that state average was, a little higher than that. If you look at people who have two or more disabilities, it's like that immediate drop again. So we have lots of numbers, and we also have 256 files from all of these committees, and every other story that we've heard. Um, and together, these are the four biggest barriers that have been apparent. These are not the only barriers, these are just the four that really rose to the top. Normally, if I were presenting a list of things, I would alphabetize them, just as one of those librarian habits that doesn't go away. But these are not alphabetized, so you can see that like this is the actual order in which they appeared. The most prevalent barrier was availability, referring mostly to the infrastructure, but also to devices. The infrastructure can be available, and if you don't have the device you need, what use is that infrastructure? Affordability was the next very significant barrier. Um, this is looking at is the internet service that's there affordable? Are devices affordable? Can a household afford enough devices for everyone to do the things they need to do? Or are they taking turns with one or two laptops after school to try to get homework done? With affordability, this um, is where we bring up the Affordable Connectivity Program. This is a federal program that actually mentioned provides a $30 a month discount for internet service in households that are under 200% of the federal poverty level. This discount increases to $75 a month on tribal lands. With Affordable Connectivity Program, it's something that over 20 million households across the nation are benefiting from. They're able to get internet service and afford groceries because this program is there. The complication with this, well, there are many complications with this. But the really glaring one right now is that this program doesn't have continued funding. Once the funding that's currently available for this program runs out, then what? And that is, that's the, the big question. It's reliant on Congress to continue that funding. And if that doesn't happen, then that doesn't happen. So it's that same pattern of like, there's a gap, and there's a need, and there is a short-term solution, and then what? What happens next? The third category that we're covering here is sustainability. So is the internet service fast? Is it reliable? Or is it gonna go in and out and drop when it starts raining? Um, what happens when something breaks? If a glass of water, like this open water bottle right next to my work computer, were to fall <laughs> over, um, what, you know, what would the consequence be? Would that be the end of me having access to a computer? Or would I go crying to Brie um, and she would have to fix it for me? I think we know the answer to that. With that, what happens when something breaks? Um, that brings up an idea of precarity. A lot of people are living in a place where they have a device, but that is their device, and if something happens to it, they might be disconnected for a while while they figure out how to fix it or how to get a new one. Um, it's the, you know, the, the stories we've heard of the child running through the apartment and tripping over the laptop cord, and the laptop falls to the ground, and that's it. It's the, the smartphone that falls into the body of water, whatever that body of water might be, and that's, that's the end of that. Safety was the last area that we chose to highlight as one of the biggest barriers. Um, this refers to, are there people who can provide tech support that are trusted? Are there people who can provide digital skills support who are trusted? Um, when something breaks, who do you trust to fix it? Safety was especially resonant and prominent with digital connection committees that were focused on adults 60 plus and the people who don't speak English well or speak a language other than English instead of English. So in households in particular that are speaking a language other than English, 
K-12 students were reported to often be the kind of source of technology and technology support. So kids are coming home from school with a laptop from the school, that then becomes the family's laptop, and the kid is providing tech support for the family. I'm like, this is what we're seeing, this is how it's gonna work. Um, and that works okay when the, the child is eager to help, and maybe nine years old, once they reach 13, maybe they don't want to help their parents anymore. And also, like, the judgment of a child is not necessarily the judgment of an adult yet. Their brains are forming. Um, so that was an area that we heard repeatedly with safety. We're going to move on to the next section, but first, are there questions? So we're gonna start taking a look at this draft plan that we have before us. Um, some clarifications first. This is not an infrastructure plan. This plan is one that is asking once that infrastructure is there, or as that infrastructure becomes available, what else do we need to be thinking about? Second, the digital connection committees have been part of this process. They've been an essential part of this process, but our office has no expectation that the committees are like endorsing or even like this plan as a draft as it is. It's a draft, like I said, it's really messy, it's long, it's probably too long. They didn't get a preview and they need time to read it. So, you know, Ashley is on the same the same level as the rest of you here with being like this is giant and we haven't really read it yet. I've read it. Well I've read it. I haven't had a team But that wasn't intended to be a jig. <laughs> But I wouldn't if it wasn't if this was not my full time job. Right. I don't know if I've read it cover to cover. <laughs> I've read it differently. <laughs> I've read it on the inside of my eyelids all night. Um, for plan clarifications, part two, it's important that we address some knowns and unknowns related to this. With our knowns, we know that we cannot put this um, ca uh, capacity grant funding that we will receive toward capital projects or infrastructure. That's something that BEAT would focus on. This funding is focused on activities, programmatic goals. With that, we're also unable to use this plan to propose policy changes or any kind of regulatory reform. Um, and this is one of those really challenging areas that keeps me awake, is that like we know that digital inequities are going to take more than a few pieces of paper to resolve, that this is all a systemic issue that digital inequities have arisen from very deliberate decisions that were intended to leave people behind. Um, and we know that we can't overcome that with a four-year capacity grant, that it's gonna take a whole lot more work than that, and it's going to require policy change. So this plan presents itself as um, a, like a strategy document for how the state will use those capacity grant funds to achieve certain programmatic goals knowing that there's still a whole lot more work to do. We also know that this plan could be used as an information document. There's a lot in here. And if someone were to choose to use information from this to form a policy or tear apart a policy, it's available. Um, the content of this plan has to meet 15 different federal requirements, some of which feel more relevant than others. We also have to address those eight covered populations, all of which are relevant. Um, and we'll have access to that capacity grant sometime in 2024. I keep saying hopefully by July 1st, our federal program officer is in the back of the room and he grimaces every time I say that. So, you know, <laughs> July 1st on um, a different calendar. Um, the things we don't know about this plan are things like how much funding we'll get for that capacity grant. We can guess that it's between 20 and $25 million, but we just don't know for sure. And we don't yet know when we'll find out, right? Do we, do we not know? Okay, we still don't know. Um, every time I say this bullet point, I'm hoping that Megan's like, actually, Hannah, we just got the email. But she's quiet, so don't, we don't know. Um, we don't know when NTIA will publish the capacity grant requirements, outlining what the state needs to do in order to get this funding, other than you know, submit an application and do this plan. We don't know when that application will be due, how long it will take to review, 
when in 2024 we'll be able to start implementing these activities. Um, so every state is in this kind of weird in-between space right now of we've worked really hard to create these draft plans, we're getting comments on these draft plans, we'll go off and edit the drafts, we'll submit them in their final form, and then we'll wait for an unknown amount of time. Um, so just know that we'll be transparent about what comes next as we find out more. And I think also just important to manage expectations that we don't have a year-round legislature. And so depending on the timing and what is in the rules of the capacity grant, we may not be able to um, if, if certain statutory language is not done within the appropriate time of our legislature. So just something to note that even if we get money or we can have money in July, that doesn't mean that we have to go ahead from our state. The good news is Megan and I get to keep our jobs. <laughs> so we at least have that. Um, but there, are, yeah, the, the unknowns are really tough to balance against like something that's so concrete and so immediate and so necessary. We're gonna talk through the sections of the draft plan first and then look at some of the actual strategies that are included within it and then finally you'll get to talk. Um, but you can still interrupt me at any time. The plan begins with a required vision statement. This was um, one of those requirements in the, the bill for the Digital Equity Act. The draft vision statement that we're working with right now is that digital equity connects all Minnesotans to opportunities, options, and each other. Um, if you want to get like way into the, the nerdy side of state digital equity and digital opportunity plans, all of the drafts are available um, for the states that have provided them so far on the NTIA website. Some, some vision statements are paragraphs long. Some vision statements are very focused on like, everyone in our state is going to have an internet connection and a device and skills to do the following things that are very concrete. Um, with digital inclusion, I think we often jump ahead to like, what, what are the material and um, like concrete solutions to this problem? focusing way too quickly on the things of digital inclusion instead of the people. Um, so that's why ours is, is trying to stay away from mentioning devices and internet access at this point and instead focusing on people. We also heard again and again and again from the digital connection committees about just disconnect in general, not disconnect between people and technology, but disconnect between people and people. That it's a state that's really torn apart um, that COVID made emotional and uh, psychological tolls that uh, don't just go away with a broadband subscription, that there's a lot of healing statewide that needs to happen, and that happens through people connecting with people. The second section is our planning process. The third looks at goals. I don't like writing goals, so I kept these at four words each, and I assure you they will change in the future. Um, but we wanted to make sure that these still focused on people, so that's where they're coming from. That the goals are not devices for everyone or internet for everyone, it's connect people to people in order to make that happen. Connect people to information in order to make that happen. And connect people to resources in order to make that happen. Um, the difference between information and resources is probably what the PhD <laughs> dissertation a librarian would write. Um, but it's, it's, there's a difference. Implementation is four phases starting July 1st of 2024. We'll see how closely we hit that target date. This is likely to change. The fifth section of the plan is the really long section that covers all eight of those covered populations. This is one of the federal requirements for it. And within each covered population, we're also required to look at assets, needs, and barriers that are relevant to each. When I started writing this part though, it just felt wrong to be like, the assets of people experiencing poverty are. Um, like it's just, it felt like such a way to like commodify a person and take a person's experience and make it into something that's no longer theirs and no longer real. Um, so like assets feels very much like a word related to commodities and a word related to monetary value. You know, the assets in my life are like, my, my car, which is the one out there without hubcaps. Um, my house, my, you know, all these material things. And it's, it's harder to like, 
describe relationships as being an asset. Like, are my friendships assets? They feel like assets, but they don't have a monetary value. Um, and we know that digital equity and digital opportunity work are grounded in those relationships and in trust, which is something else we can't quantify or commodify. That's something we can't put a price on. Um, we know that digital opportunity work starts with people coming together to solve a problem that has not been addressed otherwise. It's uh, resourcefulness and it's creativity and it's persistence. Um, so we renamed assets existing strengths. The second category that we had to address with the covered population was needs. And again, this felt like a weird thing to type out, like the needs of veterans. Um, you know, I'm, I need a drink of water and I need a day off and I need a nap. And those are all things that are a quick fix. They're a universal solution. Um, it's something, you know, I take a drink of water and an hour from now I'm gonna want another drink of water. It's something that doesn't really solve the issue at hand, but it tides me over. We know that with digital equity and digital opportunity, we're not talking about a single moment of fixing something or of providing a single solution that works for everyone. That's not how it works. That's not how people work. That's not how technology works. There's a lot of different factors at play here. And we also know that we can't just solve the digital divide in a moment, that there is really no digital divide, that it's a lot more complicated than that. So instead of needs, we're looking at unsupported necessities. And then the last category we had to take a look at was barriers, barriers to access. Um, when I think of a barrier, I think of a thing that is in my way, and I need to either move the thing or I need to go around the thing. Um, with both of those strategies to overcoming the barrier, the burden is placed on me to figure out how to do this. It's also requiring me to understand that this, this barrier has limits and that I can, in fact, go around it, that this barrier isn't just boxing me in forever. So instead of barriers, we're using the phrase systemic challenges. We know that digital inequities are part of systemic inequities, that those two are tied together. We can't just move all of the issues out of the way and not address them. That just recreates the same problems that we're already facing. The sixth section of the plan looks at areas of alignment. This is a lot of federal stuff, but I assure you it's fascinating. Um, the eighth section, are the appendices where I went full librarian. So there are eight different appendices, A through H. H is my favorite, it's the work cited. Um, there's also a glossary. With Appendix D, this is one where we like to direct attention, that Appendix D is a required list of local and tribal plans that address digital opportunity in some facet. So, you know, a, a township's comprehensive plan that mentions broadband infrastructure would be included in there. We created this list based on Google searching. Um, Google is not totally representative <laughs> of the world, so if you look at this and you notice that our city, our county, our township, our tribe is missing from this list and we have a plan, um, just let us know and we'll get it added to the list there. Any questions before we move into some of the strategies? The more I present these next three slides, the more I frustrate myself with how I've laid them out. <laughs> so, um, when we were putting these together, it became apparent that like the alignment of these strategies is not necessarily aligning with the actual goals that we specified in the draft plan. Um, so, like these two strategies here, related to goal one in the plan of the draft, um, this one was also part of goal one, but these all went with goal three. The next page is all goal two, and then the third page is a mix of goals as well. So like, we have some organizational work to do. Aside from that, these are strategies that all focus on collaborations. So this first one comes from our experience working with the digital connection committees, and it's to pilot a digital opportunity leaders network that combines local energy, like with those digital connection committees, regional expertise, maybe through contracted support, and statewide continuity through the Office of Broadband Development. We heard again and again from digital connection committees that like 
this work is really important, and this work is something that is so often done in isolation. It's you know an organization that sees a need for digital equity work, but doesn't necessarily have the resources or the professional network to make it happen, but does it anyway because it's needed, and that need is there. Um, so with this one, we're looking at how can the Office of Broadband support like those professional connections in a way that strengthens everyone's work together. The second strategy listed here is to collaborate with internet service providers that are receiving state and federal infrastructure funds to ensure newly connected households have cybersecurity resources. Um, if you're living in one of those swaths of Minnesota where you're maybe relying on satellite for your, your internet service, um, bringing high-speed internet service into your house could be a big leap. Um, bringing internet into a home that hasn't had internet access before is going to change the dynamics of that house and it raises concerns for people as well. So that's what that one's looking at. The second half of this slide is all focused on interagency collaborations, so ways our office can be more deliberate in the ways that we work with other state agencies and offices to ensure that we're not duplicating work and that we're aligning things right. So first, um, we should establish a digital opportunity work group that brings together different state agencies this is not work that's only being done in the Office of Broadband. This is work that's being done all over different state agencies. So how can we bring those perspectives together? This next one here looks at Deeds Office of New Americans, having seen in that data that people who are new to Minnesota um, as immigrants or refugees are more likely to be disconnected from technology. The third one looks at Career Force, which is the state's workforce agency. Bree shares a, a hallway with some of the workforce staff. So like we're proximal to them, but we don't always remember to talk to them. Um, so that this is us forcing ourselves to familiarize ourselves with career force and figure out how our office can better support um, the needs of job seekers. The last one here looks at the Department of Corrections and the Minnesota Career Education Center. The Minnesota Career Education Center is an adult basic education program that works throughout the state's prisons to provide um, adult basic education services, GED, testing, and also digital skills training. It's a program that has a lot of potential. It's also a program where you will have one instructor working with 112 people. Um, so it's something that we're interested in learning more about and finding ways where we can expand and support. Are there any questions or thoughts about this slide? Yes. I guess I'm just curious how you define the cyber security resources. Does that mean like, you know, um, anti virus uh, software or just general um, information about how to avoid the more and more sophisticated scams that are out there? Um, I'm just curious how you define that. Yeah, um, so the, the question is how, how do we define cybersecurity and what does that look like, cybersecurity resources in particular. That's something we have still to figure out, that like, you know, antivirus stuff is, is certainly one important component, but also like information literacy is now part of digital literacy, that knowing, you know, knowing what website is safe to put your credit card number in versus what website you shouldn't put anything personal in is part of that as well. Knowing how to you know figure out if this email is from someone malicious or if they if you really have won several million dollars, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. yes. I just be curious about a show of hands. How many people work with residents, clients today who have cybersecurity or online privacy concerns regardless? some things covered on the, not next slide, but the slide after. Okay. look at groups of people more broadly. Um, this one is really just focused on like, new infrastructure. Knowing that there's $650 million of new infrastructure. Just wanted to, just cold question as yeah. to whether or not 
those types of needs are broader, are, you know, also aligned with other species. Anything else? Quiet, this is up <laughs> um, We'll take some time after the slide, or no, after, after the slide, after the slide. To, to talk in a little more detail. I know these first two are kind of like, what? <laughs> um, so this one is focused on strategies that connect people to information, knowing that access to information is how we make change. With the first strategy, this is coming from that challenging in-between place that we talked about earlier, about how we know systemic change needs to happen and this plan can't propose policy changes to make that happen. Um, so we can't propose changes in policy with this plan, but we can use this plan to provide more information. That information could be something like, what would it look like if the state of Minnesota developed a statewide technology helpline? These are all ideas that came from digital connection committees. Um, what would it look like if the state developed a statewide program that's similar to the Affordable Connectivity Program minus the potential end date, that reduces internet costs for low-income Minnesota households and provides a device discount. How could that work? What would that look like? The third one is a report on potential models that the state could use to create a sustainable state-managed system for circulating large screen devices as long-term loans. There are programs in the state that will circulate assistive technologies as long-term loans, so like a screen reader for someone who has a visual impairment or is blind. There's also, um, you know, the long history of public libraries circulating things like laptops and devices as short-term loans. Um, so what would it look like to bring those together? If a person is maybe using a career force center to look for a job and they don't have a computer at home, but having a computer at home would give them the opportunity to develop their skills in using that computer on an ongoing basis, instead of just for the hour a day they're able to visit the library. Um, maybe that's something that this could address. The third, second strategy listed here is to build on our office's broadband infrastructure maps to also include data and maps that describe digital opportunity more broadly. So some of that data we looked at earlier, um, like we know where the infrastructure is but what does all of it really look like when it comes down to accessing that infrastructure and affording the service that's available? The third strategy here is to develop and maintain a directory of digital opportunity resources and partners for public reference. This is coming from um, some of the committees that are in the, the place of providing public services without necessarily all of the support that they need. Sometimes that includes libraries when you're short-staffed or you're new to an area or you're a rural library of three people. Um, when someone comes and has a question and has like an immediate need, who do you refer them to if you can't provide, provide the thing that they are looking for? Um, in the public library world, it's very common to have someone come in with like a technology crisis on hand. That crisis being, I need to print this form out and I need to fill out the form and I need to get it here by this time. Um, and it's stressful and no one learns anything from that process other than like how to breathe a little easier. Um, so if there were some kind of resource that could provide a guide for like, if someone's looking for a computer, if this is what's available in your area, um, is something we heard could be beneficial. Any questions or thoughts about this one? We'll move on to the information overload slide. Oh, okay. So this is the overwhelming one. Um, we'll take a moment to just absorb how many words are on this slide. I'm sorry about that. All of these strategies are focused on grant opportunities. I'm going to upset everyone and take it away, but I'll bring it right back, okay? <laughs> I just want to like zoom in on one and focus on that, and then we'll take a look at the rest. So this list of seven things, these are all different grant opportunities that our office could potentially fund using that capacity grant funding. Going back to that idea of like, this funding needs to reach the local economies, 
and the local people who are providing these services already, or who see a future for these services where they are. So this first one listed here that we've zoomed in on, it addresses goal one, so connecting people to people. The applicants would be rural cities, rural counties, townships, and organizations serving covered populations. And we imagine that could be rural or urban, no matter the community type. Um, there are a lot of definitions we still have to figure out with all of this. Like, you know, what kind of organization is considered an organization serving a covered population? A public library welcomes everyone, but does a public library really fit what we're looking for here? We have to do some work. Um, the purpose of this would be to pilot or expand digital navigator services. That's definitely something that's more common in the metro than in greater Minnesota. So I'm just curious with a show of hands. How many are familiar with what a digital navigator does? Yeah. That's an interesting data point. So for those who aren't familiar with it, a digital navigator is a person who's kind of like a digital social worker. They provide one-on-one -on -one assistance with using technology. And they have the, the, the time and the relationship and the trust with that person to get to like the root question. Um, so if a person comes into the library and they're asking, how do I print something? In the moment, you know, you just need to print the thing and that they'll continue on their way. But their question, their real question that they're not asking might be something a lot more in depth. Like, how do I revise my resume so I can apply for the job, the application for which I just printed off. Um, when I was working at Leech Lake Tribal College outside of Bemidji, there was a patron who came in and asked how to listen to jazz music on the computer. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, we can set you up with YouTube. And, and then he asked, how do I find out information about these musicians I'm listening to? So we looked at Wikipedia. And then he asked, how can I take this music home with me? I don't have an internet connection. So I did something I'm not supposed to do, and I was like, here's how you download. <laughs> you might have been legally, but here's how you do it in a way that's like safe and good. And you know, never click on the biggest download button. It's always the small one when you scroll down. And it, you know, the questions just kept continuing, and he was coming in more and more frequently. And it turns out he was living in the halfway house across the street from the library and was using some of his time there to learn more about jazz music and that interest. And he wanted to be a, like a radio DJ for jazz music, so conveniently as well, the tribe's radio station was on the corner there by the halfway house in the library. Um, and so it turned on the radio one night, and there he is with his like, jazz persona and his smooth jazz voice playing the illegally downloaded music <laughs> and reading off the Wikipedia articles that we found. And that was like part of his recovery process. That was part of him figuring out who he is and exploring an interest he otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so it was you know, so much more than a question of like, well, how do I find music? It was, it was something a lot bigger than that. The last column here looks at our like, current inclinations around these grants. There are a lot of policies and procedures and rules in place with state employees for how we administer grants or run a grant program. Um, there's also room for being strategic though and for embedding equity in a grant process itself. So with this sort of thing, we're looking at a two-tiered approach. The first tier would be a lower amount, but it would be a non-competitive amount. That would happen at a point in time. And then after, I don't know, six to nine months maybe, another point in time would occur. And at that point, we would also provide a grant round focused on a higher funding amount with that being competitive. Something we've heard time and time again is a frustration with being a small organization or a small town and having to compete with large organizations or larger communities for the same pot of funding. Um, when I was at Leech Lake Tribal College, our library was entirely grant funded and it put us in a situation where we had to compete with our peers for the same pots of funding. And those peers were like our closest collaborators and I mean some of them are still some of my best friends, but we had to compete and it was gross. And like, we know that there are some projects that are going to take more funding that organizations are thinking up. And we also know we need to take some time to build up that capacity a little bit more. Someone phrased it really well at a session somewhere in Southeast Minnesota that, so non-competitive means that it's a competition, but it's just between you and the deadline. 
Um, a non-competitive, it has to be in scope and it has to be complete and it has to be on time, but you're not competing against someone else. Are there any questions about this generic approach before I start talking through the, through the giant slide? Yes. I just wonder if you're going to be kind of what to do in sort of the way you're looking at yourself. Yeah. All of them. Okay. I'm almost there. All right. So this is this is the giant slide. After this, we'll have some clearer time for chatter. Um, this is looking at all those different grant opportunities that we could fund using this capacity grant funding. Not all the opportunities, but just some that we've highlighted. So we talked through the first one. The second one is looking at cap agencies, libraries, veterans' homes, area agencies on aging, and centers for independent living. These are groups that have a statewide focus and also address any one of those covered populations. This would also be to pilot or expand digital navigator services. And our inclination with this is that it would be something that's non-competitive, but formula-based. I don't know what factors would go into a formula, but we would be thinking equity in the process of that. The third one is looking at high schools, after-school programs, and two-year public and tribal colleges, addressing the, how they could hire and train students as paid tech repair technicians. There are some schools in Minnesota that are doing this already, so their students get job experience, they get tech skills, they get a paycheck, the school then gets um, on-site tech repair support. Some schools are also looking at how they might expand this to include families that live within that district, so that before a person treks to a store to get something fixed, they could go to the school and at least have it assessed there. We imagine this would be non-competitive and formula-based as well. The fourth one is looking at small businesses, including agriculture, especially if those small businesses are owned by covered populations. Anything that's red here is something we've added since we've started doing these sessions. Um, it's taken a lot of restraint to not revise the plan immediately. Um, but this is, this is my compromise. It's like, okay, I just, I just need to add this now. Um, the purpose of these would be to help businesses assess and improve their technology access. If a business has no technology access, that's, that's still something that needs to be assessed, like what is the best strategy for a business that has no technology or very limited technology. We imagine this would follow a similar two-tiered approach to that first one, so a lower non-competitive amount to get started, and then businesses can build up a little bit of capacity before having a larger competitive grant round. We heard from some groups that a cohort-based option could be really helpful so the businesses aren't just doing this alone in isolation. They can do this with peers that are going through the same or similar process. Number five on the list uh, looks at townships, cities, counties, regional development commissions and tribes to conduct evaluation and develop local digital opportunity plans. This is something we see as being non-competitive, maybe a set amount, but being a cohort-based options again. When we did that list of plans in Appendix D, um, all of those plans addressed broadband, at least in name. About half of them addressed broadband and affordability, at least in name. And then a very small amount addressed anything beyond that or spelled out the specifics of how to get to that point. So we see that there's like interest in doing more planning on a local level for digital opportunity, but there's not necessarily the capacity there. So that's what this would focus on. Second from the bottom is townships, cities, counties, and tribes to improve website accessibility. Um, there's a lot of funding available through the state to improve state website accessibility, but that doesn't necessarily reach local government or tribal government. All of these groups have critical and essential information on their websites. You become socially and civically engaged in your community, often through that city website, whether that's seeing what city council is up to, um, knowing what the joint planning board is going to be discussing next week, finding out where to vote. We imagine that would be non-competitive and a set amount. And that amount would be determined by a formula to be determined. The last one listed here looks at townships, cities, counties, and tribes, and also organizations serving covered populations. This is the catch-all, imagine if, what if type category. Um, so the purpose would be broad, digital opportunity work, whatever it is that we're not imaginative enough to think of, um, but you all have better imaginations than us and know what the needs are locally. And because that one would be so broad, we imagine it would be competitive. We are at 
235 ish. Because we have such a large group here, let's take until 245 to talk in small groups about these and then we'll reconvene. Does that sound okay? Got a couple nods. Are there any questions before we do that? Yes. Uh, the first and the last, Yes. what's the difference? So is it just the, the location? The difference between the first and the last is that the last is only competitive, so there's no like non-competitive option. And then instead of just focusing on digital navigation services, it broadens it to being whatever aspect of digital opportunity that you are imagining. This one also includes um, urban cities, urban counties, Right, because they both cover organizations serving cover populations. So right. that's kind of confusing a little bit. So how we categorize us, either the first one or the second one. Also, my second question is, oh, this uh, list, are there any priorities? Like the first one comes to the top, and then the last comes to the, to, to the last. Yeah, so. No one's asked about the priorities yeah. yet. These are just in the order that they showed up in the draft. Um, that's something we have to do more work on, is figuring out how to really strategize these right. in terms of priority and also timing. Okay. Yeah, it's that weird in-between thing again of like, we have this, and then we have a waiting period. So thank you for your questions. Any other group questions before we take a moment to chat? It will go until 2.45 on my little analog watch, which might not be 2.45 in reality. Yes, it will be. So 2.45, please talk amongst your tables. Um, what do you think? What is missing? I'm particularly interested in what is missing. What resonates, what doesn't.